During the Second World War, a covert Japanese squadron waged an underwater battle against northern Australia. The story of the Japanese submarines is now the subject of a book that throws new light on the bombing of Darwin in 1942. I spoke with the book's author, Dr Tom Lewis. Dr Tom Lewis, welcome to the program. Good day, Louisa. The bombing of Darwin in 1942 is a, a very well-known story, but the mm. underwater war isn't as well understood. What were submarines doing off the coast of Darwin at that time? Well, what they were doing was uh, what the Japanese aircraft carriers were doing. They were basically trying to shut down Darwin. In January 1942, uh, four big submarines came south, 80 people on board each submarine, and they used mines and torpedoes to try and close the place down. Why did the Japanese see this, this shipping channel as so vital? If you look at a big map, Darwin was one of the best sighted places to attack the Japanese and their newfound empire of uh, what's now Indonesia. But also the Japanese were trying to take New Guinea. If you take New Guinea, you can control the eastern seaboard of Australia and you can stop the Americans coming over here. This was a, a secret operation. How did mm. Australia find out that there were submarines out at sea? The Japanese made it clear themselves that they were there. Uh, they laid their four minefields and then they waited in what's called the killing zones. And uh, a convoy steamed into Darwin on the 20th of January, in the morning of the 20th of January, 1942, and they attacked it with torpedoes and they missed. And the two escorting destroyers turned and attacked the submarines and they missed too. But of course, by now, the alarm's gone off. They radio Darwin. Now, the sinking and pursuit of the Japanese submarine, the I-124, was an interesting story. Can you explain what exactly happened? One of our corvettes, which is like a, a mini destroyer, and all of a sudden they saw a torpedo coming towards them uh, very quickly at 40 knots, which is very fast. And uh, this ship, a brand new ship called HMAS Deloraine with a brand new reservist crew, did everything right. The captain, uh, Lieutenant Commander Desmond Menlove on the bridge, gave the right order. He turned the ship in towards the torpedo and it's raced past the right hand side of the ship and missed the stern by about 10 feet, a couple of metres. And then of course you charge straight down the track of the torpedo looking for the submarine and it surfaced in front of them. Now did this prove to be a bit of a morale boost for the Australians at the time? Well, it did. Um, the, the, the half surfacing was accompanied by depth charging from Deloraine, which are like uh, little drums of explosive which they hurl over the stern. And uh, they just about ran over the top of the thing, probably intending to ram as well, uh, and depth charged it to the, to the bottom. But uh, tremendous boost, I suppose. The, in fact, uh, the Deloraine people I was interviewing one the other day, he said they painted a big submarine on the side of the wheelhouse door on either side. They knew they'd killed the first Japanese submarine in World War II. So what was the impact for Darwin of the lack of success of the Japanese submarine raid? The bombing of Darwin came just a month later. Was the air raid a highly effective backup plan? And the Japanese High Command had a bit of a, a think and, well, they still wanted to close Darwin down. So that didn't work. How we do it instead? And they had a thing called the Carrier Mobile Force, which was uh, four of the carriers that had struck at Pearl Harbour. Uh, along with the 17 ships all up. And uh, over the next month they assembled them, gave them their orders, flew, uh, sent them south, and of course you know the story, on the 19th of uh, February 188 aircraft were sent off from the carriers and they struck Darwin. And they did a tremendous job. There's some pretty wild myths surrounding the I-124, that there was gold on board, that there was large amounts of mercury, mm -hmm. that there was a second submarine sunk right. nearby, and I'm wondering how has your research um, uncovered any of these, these Well, myths. and I'm pretty confident that uh, most of them are wrong. Um, there certainly doesn't seem to be any other submarine nearby. It's uh, still intact. Um, it hasn't been entered through the torpedo tubes or the hatches. Uh, it is, um, in fact, uh, largely watertight at the fore end. Uh, the, the front end sits proud of the sand. Dr Tom Lewis, thanks for joining us. Thanks a lot.